presentation this evening about U.S. imperialism and recruitment of immigrants into the U.S. military. Just a reminder to everyone to please keep yourselves on mute and we will take questions at the end. This event is co-sponsored by the New York City Chapter of the Scholar Strategy Network and Brooklyn for Peace. <clears throat> Scholar Strategy Network is an organization of university-based scholars who are committed to using research to improve policy and strengthen democracy. Brooklyn Peace is a network of Brooklyn residents working to eliminate war and militarism. And my name is Shannon Gleason, and I am based in Ithaca, New York, and happy to be joining you. I'll be moderating tonight's event, and I will start by introducing our panelists who will then share remarks before we turn to our Q&A. All right, let's start with the star of the show, Sophia Optikar, who is an Associate Professor of Urban Studies at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. She is the author of the new book, which we'll be discussing tonight, Green Card Soldier Between Model Immigrant and Security Threat, out just now with MIT Press. Sophia also writes about immigration, gentrification, and alternatives to capitalism. She is also the co-leader of the New York City chapter of the Scholar Strategy Network. <clears throat> we also have with us tonight, Lyle Jeremy Rubin, who does counter recruitment work in high school and college classrooms with We Are Not Your Soldiers. And he's the author of Pain is Weakness, Leaving the Body, a Marine's unbecoming. I'd like to also welcome Monisha Rios, who is a Puerto Rican psychologist, social worker, and anti-imperialist veteran of the U.S. Army. Since 2013, she has been investigating the American Psychological Association's 104-year role in the weaponization and militarization of psychology in service to imperialism. Monisha works to expose the psychological warfare component of U.S.-led hybrid warfare, with a special focus on the narratives used to destabilize people's movements toward liberation from capitalist imperialist oppression in Latin America, the Caribbean, and beyond. She's the founding director of Centro Solidario de Puerto Rico. And we'll finally, we'll hear from Connor Coco Tomas Reed, who is a Puerto Rican Irish gender fluid scholar organizer of radical cultural movements and the 2022-2023 postdoctoral fellow in the Publics Lab at the CUNY Graduate Center. Coco's new book, New York Liberation School, chronicles the rise of Black, Puerto Rican, and women's studies and women and movements at the City University of New York and in New York City, as well as the post-9-11 CUNY landscape. They are co-founding participant in Free CUNY, Rank and File Action, and Reclaim the Commons, and a member of CUNY for Abortion Rights. Coco has been immersed in almost two decades of struggle at CUNY and in New York City around public education access, anti-militarization, police and prison abolition, solidarity with Palestine and Puerto Rico, abortion rights, housing justice, and beyond all connections I think we will find tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker <clears throat> um, to get us going. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, and thanks so much to uh, my fellow panelists who were so generous with our time and to Brooklyn for Peace for co-sponsoring this event and uh, to everyone here uh, who are who's joining us um, from, as far as I can tell, all over the U.S. at least, if not beyond, um, really cannot wait to have this conversation with all of you. Um, so I will share um, a few visuals um, as I uh, give a few remarks about this uh, new book of mine and what it um, can tell us about counter-recruitment and imperialism. So let me share my screen. All right, I, I believe you can see it now. Please let me know if there are any issues with uh, seeing my slides. Um, so I want to start by sharing a few insights from my book, Green Card Soldier, Between um, Model Immigrant and Security Threat. This book um, is based on 72 immigrants that I, uh, 72 interviews that I conducted with immigrants from 20 countries who enlisted in the US military as non-citizens, primarily I should say since 2001. And um, the folks whose stories that I include in this book live all over the United States and in Northern Mexico. And this is a photo of me having breakfast with some deported veterans um, during my research um, in Ciudad Juarez. 
I should also say that I have never been a member of the military, um, but I, I am an immigrant. And so I approached this research and this work from um, that standpoint. So to start with the basics, um, immigrants have worked in the US military since the beginning of the United States. They have participated in every war, both by being drafted, voluntarily enlisting, and they participated in US military wars against indigenous people and US military suppression of slave insurrections. And throughout this history and in the present day, immigrants have also resisted the draft and have organized against US imperialism. So there's a lot of sides to that story. US citizenship is not required for enlistment. This sometimes surprises people, but you do not have to be a US citizen to enlist in the US military. And at least theoretically, there has long been an expedited path to US, US citizenship for those who enlist as non-citizens. I will say more about how it actually plays out in reality in a bit. Sorry, I'm trying to advance on my next slide. I'm having a little bit of trouble. There you go. Um, so some facts. Most recently, um, there are about 25,000 non-citizens um, in the US military. Thousands have been enlisting every year uh, in recent years. And there are hundreds of thousands of foreign born veterans. Um, a lot of them do have US citizenship, but a significant number still do not, uh, which is how we end up with deported veterans. Um, so those are the basics and I bet most people in this room have heard different arguments and statements about immigrants in the US military. Among liberals, um, the figure of the immigrant soldier is used to show how patriotic and deserving immigrants are. And there are also those who advocate to allow undocumented youth to get a path to US citizenship by enlisting. Um, among conservatives, there is much more commonly fear of immigrants as potential spies or infiltrators, um, those immigrants that work in the US military. And the subtitle of my book reflects this, uh, these two perspectives, right? Between model immigrant and security threat. Um, in thinking about immigrants in the US military, we have to zoom out from the narrow focus on individual life chances, right? A lot of times people talk about what does service in the military do for immigrants or individual immigrants. And what I argue in my book is we have to um, zoom out of that individualistic perspective and have a view that encompasses the whole system of international borders and also the powerful hold of the US military across the globe. And uh, you know, this is a visually many of you will be familiar with from your own organizing work of just how many ba bases there are um, U.S. military bases across the world. Migration is a complex process, but there is a lot of truth to the slogan that's on this banner, which is, we are here because you were there. The United States and its military help create migration by disrupting communities across the globe. Then the military recruits the same displaced people as troops, touting their high quality, and their language and cultural skills that um, are viewed by the military as combat multipliers, something extra that these uh, workers bring. So to make it a little bit less abstract, let me tell you a story that illustrates this. Um, one of the people that I interviewed, I call him Luis, uh, was born in Mexico. He moved to Texas with his parents uh, when he was eight years old. As a teenager, Luis, milk cows uh, alongside his father during school breaks to try to help pay off family debts that they incurred as part of their migration. Luis did well in school and he attended college, but even with loans, um, he routinely ran out of money for food. So he told me how he would get really hungry and feel dizzy and then he would eat one of those um, king-sized Kit Kat bars and you know, get a, um, a sugar rush from it. And it just became unsustainable. Um, 
And so looking for a way out of this desperate situation, Luis, after a year of college, uh, quit college and joined the army. So one way to understand a story like Luis's is to hold him up as a hardworking immigrant who overcame his tough environment to vindicate the choice of his parents to migrate to the United States from Mexico. But what I argue is that that telling is incomplete. Luis, uh, a working class Latinx teenager, was immersed in a pervasive culture of militarism and the white supremacist capitalist system that offered few living wage, non-stigmatized alternatives to those like him. And what's more, this is where we zoom out, Luis's parents were part of a long-term migration system. And the system relied on recruitment by US businesses seeking cheap workers with few rights. And their economic precarity in Mexico, which is one of the reasons they left, was a result of what US does in the region. The penetration and disruption of local economies to extract resources and profit. So Luis's pathway into the military uh, and many other folks took place within this larger structural context of US imperialism, in this case in North America. Um, I know that there are many people in the audience who are doing really critical work um, of counter recruitment in their high schools and college campuses. So I want to touch briefly on some insights from my research that might be helpful, I hope, to counter recruitment in settings that have immigrant populations. So immigrants, what I found from my research is that immigrants who came to the United States as children and grew up here, they tend to enlist for similar reasons as non-immigrants. You know, dwindling prospects for good jobs, looming debt, youth are drawn into military labor through the poverty draft. Of course, aided by the culture of militarism and extensive, extensive marketing campaigns. Also playing a role are, is valorization of warrior masculinity. And for, for some people that I spoke to, patriotism also plays a role. But few uh, of these immigrants who grew up in the United States thought very much about the fast track to citizenship. In other words, um, those who grew up in the United States, they were not enlisting because of the promise of getting US citizenship faster. Um, they, um, it was more immigrants who Im migrated as young adults. So older teenagers or early 20s, it is for them that this was really uh, the attraction of enlistment. Um, and I think that's something to keep in mind with counter recruitment efforts. And specifically what's important to know is that there is a promise of a fast track to citizenship through the military for those who do not yet have US citizenship, but it's actually now slower than becoming a citizen as a civilian. Um, the US military and US immigration systems never worked particularly well together. Um, but currently there's such a level of securitization and criminalization that um, pe people are just better off applying um, for citizenship as civilian. Without US citizenship, veterans are vulnerable to deportation. Um, and this is a photograph of, of the border wall in Tijuana that's painted over as a memorial to deported veterans. It's taken by Joseph Silva, um, and I wanna make a, a little plug for him. His, photographs illustrate my book, and he's a really um, talented photographer who has been documented deported veterans for, for many, many, many years. So just because it's not easy to become a US citizen through the military, it does not mean that the military does not use citizenship as an incentive, uh, like it does with so many other things. Um, it's one of the many promises it continues to make. Um, so why does the US military want immigrant workers and recruits them specifically, right? So there's specific marketing campaigns to, that are aimed at immigrants and immigrant families. Um, why is the Department of Defense a consistent vocal advocate for the DREAM Act, the DREAM Act that would create a path to citizenship for undocumented youth? Well, as many here uh, undoubtedly know, there is a recruitment crisis. Um, Hey, thanks probably in some part to the work of some of you in this room. And um, in this context of a pretty dire recruitment um, crisis, especially immigrants are considered to be 
higher quality, so-called. And then this is a term that the military uses because they're more likely to meet the qualification for enlistment and are less likely to drop out. And as I mentioned, they bring the skills that the military wants. Um, and they are frankly more exploitable, especially when their path to citizenship is tied to their employer um, and hinges on their relationship with this employer, which is a kind of a classic exploitative situation for immigrants. In my book, I describe what I call injuries of assimilation. And these are the injuries that we must keep in mind in counter recruitment activism. So I will stop here and let my panelists um, share their thoughts. But the final thing that I want, really want to underscore is that so-called green card soldiers are both the tools and the victims of the US empire, and they can also be the empire's beneficiaries and its resistors or both. It's complicated. Um, but one thing that we know for sure is that their predicament can't be understood in isolation from the workings of US imperialism inside and outside the borders of the country we currently know as the United States. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna now turn it to our next speaker, Lyle Jeremy Rubin, who is going to respond with some of his own experiences and reflections on this awesome new book. Great, thanks a lot, Shannon. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Uh, for anyone who's wondering, I just had knee surgery, so I'm, I, I'm kind of sitting awkward because I have one leg up on another chair. Um, but uh, I, I just wanna start off by saying, I. I you know, I was asked to do this uh, fairly recently, so I haven't finished the book yet, but I started reading it and it's just, aside from just being fascinating fascinating in itself, I'm just struck by the overlap with so many things that I learned through the years, both in the military and since I got out and particularly doing counter recruitment work. So it just means a lot for, to me to see this book out there. It's the first time I've seen a lot of these issues being discussed in such a comprehensive, well-researched way. Uh, and I encourage everyone to uh, take time to, to read it because I, I do think it's a really important book. Um, I also just want to take a, a moment to, again, um, uh, let everyone know about We Are Not Your Soldiers. Um, I believe the link has already been put up there. But for anyone who might be interested, if you're a teacher, if you're a professor, even if you're a student of some kind, um, we do both virtual and in-classroom visits. We've mostly been doing virtual uh, since COVID, but uh, I believe I, I believe we're open, or I, I'm certainly open to doing in-classroom uh, visits at this point. And I know some uh, some of uh, the others I work with are as well. Um, we also do after-school programs, uh, so it doesn't actually need to be like in the you know during the actual official hours of the class. Um, there was a piece written up about us in uh, vet uh, at, in Yes Magazine, if you want to go there. Uh, and then also, aside from myself, um, some of the other um, counter recruiters have also happened to write memoirs recently. Uh, Rosa uh, came out with a memoir very recently and also Joy. And I believe I sent those links to Shannon. Um, but if not, Stephanie, I think, is on right now, so she might be able to uh, post the, the links to their memoirs. Um, and I just also just want to mention about face veterans against the war. Um, that was a group that I got involved with, um, you know, early on when I got back from Afghanistan and got out of the Marine Corps, it was originally, um, Iraq veterans against the war. And that was inspired in turn by Vietnam veterans against the war. So there's an interesting history there. Um, there's also Veterans for Peace, which is also rooted in uh, Vietnam veterans against the war. So the first thing I want to mention in, in direct reference or in, in direct conversation with Sophia's book is one school that I've gone to multiple times uh, in the Bronx. Um, and it's heavily dominated by not just immigrants, um, but particularly immigrants from the countries that the United States is warring in, is dominating, has all sorts of neo-colonial economic relationships with, uh, particularly in the greater, greater Middle East, you know, the past 20 years. So a lot of Iraqi uh, immigrants, Afghan, Yemeni, Syrian, um, and, and alongside that Egyptian, 
um, it, you know, immigrants, uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Egypt, particularly during the war on terror, has been central to U.S. foreign policy in that region. Um, the 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 president of Egypt was considered the torture in chief for many years throughout the actual war on terror. Um, and so the, the war on terror has, in a lot of ways, destabilized that country as well. So there's it, it doesn't necessarily need to be a place that we're officially uh, conducting a war in in order um, for these types of migrations to, to take place. But this school in particular is being um, targeted by recruiters precisely because these students, A, um, are looking to become naturalized, as Sophia um, emphasized, uh, and B, they have um, the language skills that are relevant to the types of operations that the military is conducting in, in these parts of the world. Um, and might even have some other kind of cultural knowledge, um, historical background that particularly the intelligence services uh, are interested in exploiting in one way or another. Uh, and that I was actually in the intelligence community while I was in the Marine Corps. Um, I was in from 2000 to two, that, 2006 to 2011, and I was a signals intelligence officer. And I, I can say it's not just, I mean, a, a lot of it is the language skills, but it's also uh, the, the, you know, it, a lot, this, these more cultural, historical um, aspects as well that they're, that they're interested in. Um, I mean, they like to have people that are like, I'm, I'm one of you. Um, you know, it makes the, it makes the intelligence much more effective that way. Um, I, another thing I want to mention about going to this school is um, while I, a few years ago when I was still actually going to the classroom, uh, this was during the Trump years. And there was actually an interesting tension between Trump, who at the time was opposed to uh, letting in any more green card soldiers into the military for racist or nativist reasons, and uh, the mili military establishment as a whole um, that you know, saw that that's a lot to gain from continuing to let uh, these types of uh, immigrants into the military. So there are interesting fissures on the right uh, when it comes to these questions, um, and it's just something I think to to keep in mind. Um, and and I, I will say, like most of the military leadership, kind of was happy once Trump was out for this reason because they could continue to uh, recruit. Um, um, you know, immigrants with these types of skills. Um, just to talk a little bit more about like other classrooms we go to, um, we do speak to J. Razzi programs. Um, surprisingly enough, we've had, particularly in Staten Island, there's one school in particular uh, where there's a major there uh, who was always open to having me come into the classroom. Uh, and a lot of these a lot of these students are uh, the sons and daughters of cops and 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 veterans, um, but also you did have uh, immigrants in in these J Razzi programs as well. Um, so that was that was an interesting experience for me. Um, when it comes to the the kind of Sophia writes in the book and, and mentioned it in in her introduction, uh, the whole idea of the American dream. Um, it is just central. I mean, this is something, particularly when I was speaking at the J. Razzi uh, classrooms, uh, the idea of achieving mobility in the United States is obviously a very strong, uh, has very strong appeal. Um, and, but on, on the other hand, you know, um, you know, a lot of these people, it is, it is complex. So a lot of these young people are in some way aware of what's happening in the countries that their families come from. Uh, so they, you know, there is this, um, ambivalence there, uh, and going back to the Bronx school, I mean, it's interesting. A lot of these, the Iraqis or the Yemeni children, uh, kids that I spoke to, uh, uh would come up to me after the, after my talk and they would, um, they would say, I, you know, I had some vague sense that like why my family is here, um, but I really didn't understand the big picture. And now I understand the big picture. And, you know, and I was seriously considering joining the military. And now I won't be found within like a thousand miles of a recruitment center. And 
I've heard that kind of comment just multiple times at this point. And it's, it was shocking to me at first. I mean, how could they not know, um, you know, why, you know, why their family migrated in the first place? Um, and, you know, they, I've, I asked them this and they say, you know, their parents are pretty uh, quiet uh, about these, these, you know, the backstory um, for all sorts of reasons. And, um, you know, I, I just thought that fascinating. And I think there is a lot of value uh, just in that, that alone, just like being able to, they migrated when they were, you know, old enough to have some memory of what was going on. Um, but there's all sorts of forces at work in America for not only the society as a whole to keep quiet, on what's really going on, but even these families themselves to keep quiet. Um, and I had a lot, a lot more remarks that I wanted to touch on, but I, I believe I'm already approaching my time limit. I'm not sure. Um, so I, I do want to open it up to the rest of the panelists, and then maybe I'll touch on this other stuff uh, later on in the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lyle. Um, we'll turn it over now to Monisha Rios. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for writing this book. Um, I know not a lot of people think of Puerto Ricans as immigrants, but in the actual context of colonialism and imperialism, we are. Um, we are we are imposed with citizenship and have been since 1917. There was no vote. There was no democratic process to make that decision. There was no democratic process in the decision by the Creole elite of the time that asked the United States to invade, to liberate them from Spain so they could have economic control and that they could collaborate with U.S. imperialism, which to them was more beneficial. So now that I've said that, <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot also that I, I'm really relating to um, in terms of how I was recruited as a child. Um, the targeting of black and brown indigenous children, um, immigrant children, the weaponization of immigration, the whole uh, psychological warfare of survival through assimilation. So I, the area of Puerto Rico that my family comes from is Vieques, Puerto Rico. And if you haven't heard of Vieques in the past, it's one of the places that was so badly militarized um, after the conquest of Puerto Rico, the second conquest of Puerto Rico, um, so that the U.S. could seize the strategically valuable location, um, control the entrance of competing empires into Latin America and the Caribbean so that they could control the land and resources, including the human resources. And so for Puerto Ricans, we are one of the human resources that militarism and imperialism need to survive. Our uh, version of being the model minority and the model immigrant sets a, an example for a lot of other people who are forced out of their homelands. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a lot because this is, this is something that brings a lot out of me. Um, being a veteran and being raised without the story, like Lyle was saying, like, I didn't get taught the history of, of, of how the U.S. had destroyed the island of Vieque and how all of the wars since 1941 had been rehearsed there um, and how that impacted my own family and continues to impact my own family to this day, which is why I was born outside of Puerto Rico to begin with. So you have so much impact. Um, and I did also want to offer that um, there's a lot of difference in terms of how the statistics surrounding how many U.S. military installations exist in the world are communicated, how, the, how that data is collected and interpreted. And if you look at the DOD's own paperwork, um, their business plans, you can Google all of this. It's available to the public. Sometimes it's even blatantly on their website. Um, there's approximately 4,800 U.S. military defense sites is how they define it themselves on all of the continents in over 160 countries. 
and that's almost verbatim from the DODs. Um, they brag about being one of the largest holders of real estate in the world. And I can't quote the number directly, but it's somewhere around 27 million something acres of land around the world. So when you think about all of these other military installations, not only maybe a forward operating base um, or how David Vine defines or interprets bases and defines bases, which is commonly used in the peace movement, you have all of these other situations that land is stolen, uh, people are displaced, it, it, people are forced to, to flee, even if it's not necessarily a conflict situation, it's an economic conflict situation that the US creates with its presence. Um, I feel like I'm jumping around because there is so much. Um, I think in terms of counter recruitment, I did do counter recruitment in California in an immigrant community. Um, a Spanish speaking immigrant community um, with truth and recruitment. And the similarities between the experiences of Puerto Rican people, which for a time, and I don't know if this is still true because I can't find the actual stat, um, we were the largest population of Spanish speaking people in the US military. And I don't know if we still are. Um, but that, that means that we, <laughs> we were weaponized not only against our own people, uh, but also against their people um, through the um, WINSEC, the Western Hemispheric Institute for Security Cooperation, through Puerto Ricans are very valuable in terms of being able to go and invade through, through various means, including um, um, the insidious, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? like underhanded ways of just going in and not necessarily wearing a uniform, but just setting an example of, look, look how great our life is in the US. Look how, how much we have that you don't have because of your government. So they really carry, we really carry the narrative forward with our own experience of colonialism and the, the attachment that has been created for us to the United States and the US way of life. Um, and it creates, a very deep moral injury. I don't know if if that's something that comes up in your research, Sophia, but um, it, it's a common thread when when we talk amongst ourselves the as veterans, particularly when we're talking to our own people, um, this comes up. And that creates a whole other set of things to deal with um a whole other layer of trauma um that us born citizens who go into the military have a different type of moral injury to contend with when you're weaponized against your own people because the conditions have been created for you to suffer and you just want a way out of suffering and then you finally learn what that means, what the ending of your suffering means that you are creating suffering for somebody else who was in the same situation that you were in. It's, it's heavy. Um, and also please tell me when, when time's up. Um, And also please tell me if, um, if I've jumped around so much that I'm not making sense. I apologize. I also had surgery. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm navigating what my body is telling me right now, as well as what I would love to tell you all. Um, okay, thank you, Lyle. Uh, so in, in the research that I've been doing on psychological warfare, the weaponization of, of immigrants is a, a huge part of that. Um, specifically because when we're trying to cut through the colonial narrative that we're being taught, that we have to let go of our own cultural ways and we have to let go of our language and we have to completely shred ourselves from the inside out and deny who we are, um, deny our connection to the land and deny our connection to our ancestors and all of that just to survive. Um, that 
when we're thinking of counter recruitment and we're thinking of how do we work around that, the identity crisis, how do we work around the psychological and emotional trauma? How do we work around the physical threat? When I'm doing counter recruitment here in Puerto Rico, there is a, a, another person from Vieques who came um, to say, I have a medical solidarity house um, for Viequeses because we don't have a hospital in Vieques. Um, and the level of cancer because of the military presence is so high, like we're losing people left and right. Um, but this, this person came asking me to guide them through getting recruited into the, the Air Force, even though they kept saying, I hate the gringos. I hate the military. I want nothing to do with them, but I'm tired of being poor. And I know you were in the military. So can you please tell me what do I need to do to pass the ASVAB? Can you help me study? Can you help me learn English so that I'll be more desirable? Because I don't want to be poor anymore. And that's how they get us. And no matter what I've told him about the sexual violence, no matter what I've said about how, you know, dude, you, you could potentially be raped. Or you may be put in the position to have to, to do that to somebody else. Or you may be put in the position to have to be quiet while you watch somebody else do that to somebody else. Some innocent person. Um, nothing, nothing that I say can cut through that desperation that this man has to not be poor anymore. And that's how they get us. I'm sorry. I'm going to stop here because it's too much. Thank you, Monisha. You were really powerful and we appreciate your perspective. We're going to turn it over now to Coco, um, Tomas Reed, who will give us his perspective and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you both for laying the beginnings of what is already shaping up to be an awesome discussion. Thank you so much. Um, please just give me one moment so I can uh, start to share my screen. Okay, when I share my screen, are you, um, are you able to still hear me? Am I coming in okay? Yes, but I don't see anything other than a text that says that you have started screen sharing. I don't see anything specifically. There we go. Oh, okay. There we go. You see it now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry about that. Um, just to say really briefly, so I had, um, I'm a com coming into this from a bit of a different standpoint. Um, I've never been in the US military and actually my, when in, they were in their youth, my mother and father were involved in anti-war and anti-nuclear arms organizing with a radical Catholic group called the Swords to Plowshares Movement. And um, so in fact, both of them in Baltimore and then in Washington state would try to reach out to people who were enlisted in the military or who were somehow a part of the military and arms industrial complex and would try to encourage them to move in the direction of peace. And so um, that's a, a little bit of what I'm hoping to build upon in this presentation with talking about the past and present of uh, organizing against empire at the city university of New York. So I'm going to get started. And, uh, about the first minute and a half of what I'll be sharing is, uh, the first few pages, um, or the first few paragraphs of my book, New York liberation school. The first time I set foot on the city college of New York campus was for a protest in March, 2005, Students and workers held a picket in front of a military recruiter's table at a campus career fair. The action was part of a national wave of counter recruitment efforts responding to the expanding US wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Three city college students were brutally assaulted by campus police. One had his face smashed into a concrete wall. Another, all five feet, one inch of her was pinned to the ground by several guards and handcuffed. A day later, a staff member who had also participated was escorted from her desk and arrested. Calls for the activist's suspension and job termination ensued. At this protest that I attended soon afterwards, students, workers, and neighborhood residents decried the arrests as well as narrowing access to public education, racist recruitment methods, imperialist oil wars, and the violence of policing. 
They also affirmed the power of collective self-defense. Speakers linked the occupations in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Palestine with repression at home. Many alluded to the City University's long militant history through which poor people of colors reshaped their institution and communities. The rally generated an outcry that ultimately rescinded all charges against the City College for. So this was my first experience at City College of educational direct action. And it was staged amidst, as you can see, these towering neo-Gothic buildings and rolling lawns within this inner city Harlem neighborhood. And I have to say it was awe inspiring. I knew instantly that I wanted to make a study and movement home here. One favorite chant from that day, free CUNY has resounded in my ears ever since as both a demand and a promise. City College and CUNY have a long history of resisting US militarism. After World War I, many of the students whose families had been displaced by war saw nothing great about imperial regimes fighting each other by risking the lives of their poorest populations. We must remember that the Bolshevik Revolution began as an anti-war protest. Between 1933 and 1938, many US students took the Oxford Pledge, promising not to participate in foreign wars. At the first national student strike against war on April 13, 1934, 800 City College men and 300 Hunter College women amassed to condemn war, while a mass walkout at Brooklyn College left its classrooms virtually empty. CUNY students were prescient in seeing the rise of fascism in Germany, Italy, and Spain, and actually went to fight in the 1936-39 to 39 Spanish Revolution. About 3,000 volunteers who called themselves the Abraham Lincoln Brigade deployed from the United States. Around half were from New York City, and at least 60 of these volunteers were from City College, including the student body president at the time. So fast forward to the mid-1960s. This was a pivotal moment in CUNY history when people were active in civil rights and desegregation campaigns, as well as transnational and anti-colonial solidarity. At City College, a group of Euro student anti-war activists who called themselves the City College Commune would interrupt and ridicule ROTC trainings on campus. You can see that on the bottom right. At Brooklyn College in 1967, thousands of students protested two recruiters from the Navy on campus. Police were called in, 40 people were arrested. And at its peak, 1,000 students and 200 police were involved in this battle. In the spring of 1969, City College students sabotaged an ROTC recruitment event by pouring ox blood on the registration table. This contributed to the atmosphere in which the 1969 Harlem University takeover by Black and Puerto Rican students could emerge. Black and Puerto Rican youth also organized against the draft, infusing the GI resistance movement with Black power and anti-colonial energies and calling attention to decolonization struggles taking place elsewhere in Africa, the Caribbean, and beyond. Asian American students also transformed the politics of the anti-war movement from the phrase, bring the war home, to stop killing our Asian brothers and sisters. Puerto Rican students themselves took inspiration from these anti-war and anti-ROTC draft actions that were happening at the University of Puerto Rico. And at UPR, they besieged ROTC buildings and they even exchanged solidarity communiques with the Vietnamese Student Union, as you can see at the bottom. Ultimately, student coalitions were able to kick out the ROTC from CUNY in the early 1970s through mass protests, building occupations, even arson, as the university was desegregated through open admissions and decolonized through the rise of Black, Puerto Rican, Asian, and women's studies. My friend and teacher, Emil Alkali, recalls from this time at City College, quote, if you wore an army jacket in 1969, 1970, or 1971, it either meant you were a veteran or that you identified with the soldiers and veterans fighting the war against the war in Vietnam. That was still the case when I took classes at City College in New York in the mid-1970s. The draft had passed me by, 
but a number of the students studying ancient Greek with me were older and survivors of the war in Vietnam. They were eager to find and lose themselves in texts as archaic and startling as their experiences must have been." End quote. After open admissions vastly changed the CUNY system from a majority Euro descended to a majority people of colors, the federal government forced CUNY to impose tuition in 1976. Now we must remember that this was after the resounding US defeat in Vietnam. So rather than have a national period of reflection, of mourning the loss of lives in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and the United States, the government quickly began to cut social goods like free public higher education. So we must see that the rise of what we now refer to as neoliberalism also shapes our story at CUNY and New York City. And that if you zoom out, that we need to uh, see that capitalism has built in cycles of using the spoils or using the defeats of war to immiserate people both on and off the battlefield. So this is a built in cycle within this economic system. So now I'll take it back to where I began. When I began to study at City College in 2006, there was no ROTC, but we often saw military recruiters on campus, at the gates, in the cafeterias, and sometimes at our classroom doors. I don't presume that this was the case 20 blocks south at Columbia University. We were a multi-ethnic, working class, multilingual, majority immigrant college with talented students who were struggling to pay tuition and usually working more than one job while taking full course loads. We were keenly aware of how fucked up recruiters' presence and pitch for free college and a road to citizenship was. At the time, groups like Campus Anti-War Network coordinated citywide and nationwide counter recruitment campaigns to recruit people away from the military and into the anti-war movement. We gained inspiration from Puerto Rico, which in 2003, as Monique had mentioned, successfully ousted the US military from the Puerto Rican island of Vieques. We studied geopolitically and historically why the US was trying to use complete fabrications to conduct regime change, usurp resources, impose despotic leaders who would follow the US's orders, bomb civil society centers like libraries and hospitals while defending oil rigs, and all the while claim that this was to bring freedom. We also studied pan-Arab pan solidarity, third world and global south solidarity, to learn why the struggle for Palestinian liberation from Israeli settler colonialism was the widespread sentiment in Iraq and Afghanistan. We hosted veterans on campus, many of them our age, from Iraq Veterans Against the War, now called About Face, as Lyle noted, to share about their experiences, which included resisting orders from their commanding officers, refusing to redeploy, and refusing to fight once they arrived on the battlefield. By the early 2010s, as college and citywide militancy proliferated in response to a whole range of things, Arab Spring, the Squares movement in Spain, Occupy Wall Street, student uprisings in Chile, Puerto Rico, Quebec, and the rise of what would be called Black Lives Matter, we learned that the CUNY administration intended to re-militarize our university. They ended up bringing back ROTC. They hired former US Army General and CIA counterintelligence director, David Petraeus, to teach at Macaulay and they welcomed weapons research contracts with the Department of Defense. So in 2013 to 2015, a massive anti-militarization campaign ensued at CUNY, in which many courageous students and workers fought to kick US empire out of our university again. As one journalist put it, quote, America's most diverse university was turned into a war zone, end quote. Student activists hounded Petraeus on the street to and from class. And at one point, there's video of this, he almost got himself run over by an MTA bus as he hurried across the street. We held what we called counter classes to present an anti-war curriculum that could reverse the pro-war propaganda that was in his class, including fracking industry sponsored articles funded and written by oil companies. For ROTC, it was undemocratically reinstated at three CUNY schools. 
And Medgar Evers, where I was teaching at the time, which is one of CUNY's majority black women's colleges located in Crown Heights, workers and students amassed a successful campaign to boot them off again. However, the ROTC is still at, col still at City College and New York College. Meanwhile, junior ROTC, as Lyle had also noted, is in many of our middle schools and high schools, and recruiting centers are often callously located just a block away from CUNY campuses. So to the US military and New York's power elite, CUNY's diverse population promises a strategic advantage to recruit educated immigrant students from the very countries and regions where the United States is currently undertaking operations. Of course, the flip side of this is that our CUNY students coming from countries where the US maintains its almost 1,000 foreign military bases may not be predisposed to welcome the arrival of the military on our college campuses. These factors have made CUNY a potential dream recruitment site for the military and simultaneously its worst anti-imperialist nightmare. So through this events dialogue, through ongoing collaborations between our groups and others like the dissenters, Yaya Network, veterans, unions, neighborhood organizations, and in solidarity with people across the world who are resisting empire, I hope that we in CUNY and in New York City can honor these forebears who have paved the way with these abundant lessons. And in closing, I'll say, if there's any soldier that I want to be, it's for human liberation, it's for ecological healing, and it's for peace worldwide. And I hope that you all tuning in tonight will enlist alongside me in that mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coco. Um, we're all excited also to read your book. So please send around any information about any forthcoming events where we can learn more. Um, okay, we are going to open it up for questions. And what we're going to do is take questions at about three at a time and then open it up for folks to respond. I just want to um, make a request that folks keep their questions brief so that we can maximize the limited time we have remaining. And um, if you would rather put it in the chat, um, that's fine as well. And I can gather some of those. So if you have a question, please raise your hand at the bottom. You'll see under the reactions button, you can press that little happy face and a, a, a one of the hand um, options will come up. Um, and we have some in the Q&A function, which we can start with. Uh, Chris Velasquez, uh, do you want to ask your question or I can read it for you? Okay, I will go ahead and put these out there. So we have two questions in the Q&A, which I'll ask for folks. One is, um, is there an additional influence on recruitment again amongst diaspora that originated in the lessons learned through the export of American militarism at the School of Americas. And so perhaps Monisha or Lyle or Coco, if you wanna tell folks what the School of Americas is, is um, that might help contextualize um, the, the role that that institution plays. Chris also asks, does the military's renewed focus on recruiting through gaming appeal to black and brown children at higher rates of penetration in conjunction with the focus on 22 most impoverished cities for recruitment? So it sounds like we have two questions here, one about the School of the Americas and one about the kind of gamification of, of war and what that might have to do um, with some of the trends we're talked about here. And Bruce, I see you have a question, so we'll let you also jump in. Uh, okay, uh, I'm, I'm a, quite a bit older than most of the folks here, and I'm a Vietnam vet. Uh, and back then, it was not uncommon uh, for uh, uh, for courts uh, to tell young offenders that rather than sentencing them to jail, they would offer them a chance to enlist in the military. Uh, and I wonder if that's common today. If I could just jump jump in real quickly, um, I definitely uh, in my boot camp platoon, uh, I met some guys that they told me that that was the offer that they were given. Uh, I also actually I, I wanted to mention uh, there was one green card soldier in my platoon who uh, struggled with with English and because of that had a really tough time uh, throughout the boot camp cycle. 
um, because so much of it is just very quick orders that you have to obey instantaneously. Something as basic as like taking off elements of your clothing. Um, and, you know, it was, he had a really, really tough time. And so I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, there's there's just so many additional obstacles that green cards, green card soldiers in particular have to face. And I know Sophia writes about a lot of them in 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 her book. Um, to the School of America's question, um, I think, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that, but I would emphasize that in a lot of ways, like the, the whole idea of the School of the uh, of the Americas is like we're going to train the people of this country to police uh, and dominate their own their own people for our own purposes, particularly purposes of profit. And really, I, I do think that's ultimately exactly the same thing that happens when it comes to recruiting uh, potential green card soldiers uh, within the official borders of the United States. In other words, I think it's something of a mirage, the border, uh, you know, it, there's an official difference, but um, ultimately it's, it's more or less the same um, enterprise that is that's being conducted. Thanks, Lyle. Monisha, Coco, you want to jump in on any of these questions regarding uh, relationship to the carceral state, um, School of the Americas, or gaming? Sure. Um, so like Lyle, I also had people in my platoon who were, who had been told that by a judge, either a local judge, you know, where they had been popped for something minor and was told that um, as, you know, juvies <laughs> trying to, to scare them into submission in society. Um, but it was, it was young, like 17, 18 year olds that I was with. Um, so, uh, and to the School of the Americas question, I would say, yes, absolutely. Because one of the things that the training at um, SOA now WINSEC gives the US military is a lot of insight into the communities, into the populations that they're targeting for the psychological warfare, which includes maintaining the war narrative at home among the diaspora communities of the countries that they're targeted for um, invasion because they need the diaspora community to carry the war narrative forward. And that happens when you have diaspora actively being recruited, actively wearing the uniform, and while wearing the uniform, talking about their homeland and talking about their perspective on what's happening in the homeland, which is usually influenced by the U.S. war narrative. So me, it, it, it would seem that the School of the Americas being what it is, what it was, and what it is now today, that that does give a lot of insight for that. Um, and Recruiting through gaming, I don't know stats on that, um, but I would imagine when when we think about the the colonial narratives that we're taught, that how we're taught to think about ourselves as Indigenous Black and Brown people, um, in relationship to our value, we commoditize ourselves or commodify. I don't know which is the right word, and and. And so we use that that emptiness and that lack that that is is forced into us by the system of capitalism to to thirst and hunger for the things that are going to make us feel valuable. And so especially for displaced indigenous people, which in in in, in my opinion and the opinion of many others, the descendants of of enslaved African peoples are displaced indigenous people. Um, we are left with nothing else except a hole and a void that we need to fill with whatever we can. So I think gaming is a way of filling that void. It's a way of, um, it can be a coping mechanism for a lot of people and a way of escaping circumstances. And when you think about the circumstances that our communities live in, in the most impoverished areas, because that's most likely where we are, yes. But I don't, I, again, I don't have statistics to support that. It's just a guess. Thank you, Monisha. Let's open it up for questions again um, and see, Coco, maybe you can jump in on the next round here. 
Does anyone else want to jump in? With a thought or question, either in the chat, you can raise your hand, or there's also Abraham. Hey, good evening. Thank you, everybody, for um, the great presentation. Um, so uh, I apologize if what I asked has already been answered to some degree, but my question was uh, sort of for Professor Aptekar. Um, I know earlier it was mentioned that um, some of your research touches on alternatives to, to capitalism. And um, in my opinion, I guess like from my experience, a lot of the, some of the reason that um, like people in my family, like first generation children of immigrants um, have joined the military is sort of because, you know, their material conditions, right? Like they feel like the military is the best option for them. So I was wondering um, if if any of your work on alternatives to capitalism has intersected with like this type of research in terms of like thinking about ways we could steer people away and like the anti-recruitment work that um, other folks in the room are doing. Thanks so much, Abraham. Let's take another question and we can cluster a few responses. Anyone else want to jump in? Nagida, oh, Boida, go for it. And then I think Nagita, I think there was a hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah hi. Sure, I, just, I just wondered, um, I think Sophia, at the, near the end of your talk, you sort of mentioned that immigrants can sometimes be a force for resistance. And we heard from Coco about lots of resistance movements, you know, at CUNY. Um, but I wondered if um, any of you could speak to like resistance within the military or if you have encountered stories of, like that. Thanks, Boyda. We'll take uh, Nagina's question and then we'll open it back up and maybe we'll start with Coco and then work back through the group. Um, go for it, Nagina. Okay, sorry, I had to find the unmute button. Um, so I had a question for Lyle. Uh, as you do your outreach work with your um, organization, what alternatives are you providing uh, those schools in those settings? Um, I say that just, I am currently serving in the army, been in 23 years. Um, so I'm not an immigrant, but I come from a family lineage of uh, people in the military. So it's it, it, like, I'm a friend of Sophia's. So it's, it's interesting to be here to see the opposite spectrum. Um, and, and I, 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 I've told my daughter that she can't go into the military, you know, um, because of the stuff that I've experienced personally and from, people, from what I've seen firsthand. So, and Sophia knows that I also work in schools. Um, so how do you, what, like, if I, I can't personally because I'm still in be that anti, but what is the alternative that you provide, especially in Staten Island, you mentioned that, and I was JRL DC four years. So what would you, what would you say to me as a high school senior who's thinking about what's the alternative from of avoiding poverty, of, you know, uh, living in an inner city, not having the money. Um, so what would you say? Thanks all. Um, Coco, do you wanna start us off? Otherwise we can go to the question that was directed specifically at Lyle before we jump in. If you'd like just for the flow of it, Lyle, if you'd like to respond to that question and then I can jump in. Yeah, uh, just real quick. Th thanks for that question, Nikita. So I actually struggle a lot with this and we all do things differently, but I actually, because of my own, you know, I, I come from solidly upper middle class, I'm white. Like I don't go in the classroom and just like tell, you know, <laughs> tell these kids like you're not joining, don't join. Like I, it's to me, it's more about um, getting them to think critically about this and hopefully you know, I make clear, I, look, honestly, I don't want you to join. And if you can find a better opportunity uh, out there, then certainly that's what I would encourage you to do. But but I also make it very clear that I'm well aware of the dynamics of the political economy and how this all works. I mean, uh, I actually am not someone that believes that, and I, I don't think any of the people on the panel would, would believe that counter recruitment work in itself uh, is going to make a major dent. I mean, ultimately, we need to change the society. And until we do that, um, people, are, you know, most people that are poor or working class, uh, you know, a lot of immigrants that are looking to naturalize, they're still going to make the choice to join. Um, and I, I make that clear, you know, I make that clear to the students like in, throughout the discussion. 
Um, but I, but I basically, it's more about, you know, and we do, we do pass out like a, a piece of paper that has like alternative career paths, uh, like AmeriCorps and stuff like that. But, um, but really the emphasis is more about getting them to, to kind of see how they're being used already. <laughs> Just like, uh, and, 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 and if they, no matter what decisions they make in the future, maybe they'll be more inclined to not only think critically, but then ultimately get involved either in the military or, um, outside the military to oppose these systems and to call for, you know, uh, more equal, hopefully post-capitalist, uh, futures. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Lau. Thank you. Coco, you, you want to jump in and then we'll turn over to Manisha if she has some thoughts? Sure. Um, so just to share a couple of things, um, I'm just tremendously grateful for this conversation. And um, just to speak real quick on a few different pieces, I feel like the question about School of the Americas, you know, literally that there, uh, that was its former name, but literally there was a school for counterinsurgency. There's a, a pedagogy of empire that the people in power are studying that we also have to study and I think in particular that that had arisen in particular after the U.S. war in Vietnam for a specific Central American intervention. And so a lot of times when people are asking, why is it that there is, um, a, you know, a massive wave of people migrating from different parts of Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Venezuela, um, you can look at different interventions like what the U.S. has done in regime change and, um, you know, death squads. And and that is is a part of the pedagogy of empire. And so, you know, it's um, I'm not sure that they chose that name by accident. Um, thinking about counter recruitment um, to uh, uh, the person's question around, like, what do we do when there are these promises that are given for people who are trying to seek jobs to support their families? I think part of counter recruitment is to make sure that um, that we're also alongside people and and trying to figure out ways how to find good, well-paying jobs where people are not getting exploited, where people are unionized, where people can support their families, and that they can apply skills that they have or interests that they have that within the U.S. military context would be for very specific, very limited aims. So, someone who's interested in like engineering or communications would have to like, you know, have on their back a radio, right? Um, and instead like applying that to a variety of fields. Um, I think it's important for veterans to talk about what actually military experience is, that it's not about critical thinking, about enjoyment, um, that a lot of it is following commanding officers. Um, and, you know, what we had experienced in CUNY and New York City was we would literally set up alongside where military recruiters were, and we would present an alternative peace perspective. We would also uh, critically challenge them. We would ask them, what about this? What about that? So we were engaging with people as a way how to also set it up where it wasn't just recruiters being able to um, say anything they wanted without it being fact-checked, without it being challenged. And I'll say just one last piece that um, the piece on resistance within the military, um, that is um, a really crucial part of all of this work. There are women who are speaking up against rape, one out of four to one out of two uh, uh, women and femme people experience sexual harassment and assault. There are queer folk who are speaking up against homophobia and transphobia. Intelligence workers like Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden who defected, who decided I'm not going to process and keep these secrets, I'm going to reveal them. Um, but it is a bit of a different time than um, during the U.S. war in Vietnam, when there were hundreds of GI resistance newspapers, when there were these really massive movements that were infused in the GI um, um, consciousness, um, people were, quote unquote, fragging their commanding officers, or they were doing search and avoid missions. So they would try and find out where the, quote unquote, enemy is, and then they would make sure to avoid them because they were trying to avoid conflict. Um, so I think really, um, trying to support and hear more of and circulate more news about resistance that's occurring within the military will be crucial. Um, and then finally, I feel like um, it's incumbent on us living within an empire to support the liberation movements in places where the United States is occupying. So um, to make sure that we foreground that as well. And I'm curious if uh, Monisha or Sophia have some thoughts on, on any of that or, or other things that are coming to mind. Great. Let's. Uh... Monisha, if you want to jump in and then we'll turn it over to Sophia. 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so when I've done counter recruitment um, with particularly young women, um, I take a similar approach as Lyle, where I, I just say, I would rather you didn't, but if you're going to, I, I always ask permission to share reality um, age appropriately. Usually um, there's a hard way to find an age appropriate word for military sexual violence, you know, um, but also young women, we need to know these things anyways. So, uh, um, but I try to prepare them for that possibility. I try to prepare them for all of the worst case scenarios that they could encounter and ask them to really look inside themselves and um, wrestle with that, you know, for as much uh, that a, a 17 year old or a 16 year old can wrestle with themselves on things. Um, but as far as alternatives, I really, really, really like this question, particularly given our current conditions inside the United States and it actually in the world, right? What viable alternatives actually exist right now? Because I personally can't think of any. It's not the same as it was years ago when I first started doing counter recruitment. And there may be, may, there were alternatives that I could offer these students. There were pamphlets. There were things that could actually give them an income that they could survive on potentially. Nowadays, I'm not so sure. So I think I would take a different approach and, and especially with the, the generation that's coming up now, I don't think they have very many blinders on. And I think that there could be a very honest conversation about there may not be an economically viable alternative that you will find in the near future. So what are other ways that you can survive with dignity in community? What are other things that you can get involved in to create a safety net for yourself and, and just speak in real tangible terms with them on, on that? I don't know if that would work, um, but it's a, it's a thought. Thanks so much, Monisha. Sophia, you want to jump in? Yeah, and thank everybody for such great questions. Um, um, Abe, you're pushing me into a direction I really need to work on more, which is uh, combining my work on the military with my work on anti-capitalism. And I think like uh, the others um, had really profound things to say uh, that speak to your question. So the only thing that I would add is that you know, the U.S. military is an enforcer of the imperialist capitalist order. And so, you know, in terms of providing alternatives within that system, like, as others have said, like counter recruitment um, is inadequate, right? Um, like the fight against the U.S. military is part of the fight against capitalism and vice versa. Um, and that's kind of a lot to think of uh, about, but... Uh, that that's kind of what I was thinking um, as far as your question. And Boyd, thanks so much for your question, moving us into discussions of resistance, which are so important with the subject. Um, I try to write about different historical examples in my book, which there are plenty, you know, from St. Patrick's uh, Battalion of Irish immigrants deserting, um, you know, during the, um, I think the Spanish-American War and going over to the Mexican side to um, the first um, the first person um, who, um, I just wanna get this right, refused deployment um, in the Iraqi war was a green card soldier, Camilo Mejia. Um, and he spent time in prison for it and he can never get your citizenship because of that after, after being in the military for eight years up to that point. Uh, so they're in, in between, you know, they're, they're, they're really important examples of resistance. And some of them are immigrants and we know about it. And I think there's just a lot there that we don't necessarily always know about and on different ways to resist some that are kind of fit our uh, kind of, uh, idea of what resistance looks like and others less so that have to do more about like the everyday acts of solidarity. Um, in survival. Oh, you have that book too, Coco. Yeah. 
um, the everyday acts of solidarity and survival of, of people who, you know, maybe were playing video games and then signed up when they were 17 and then have a long contract. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll stop talking because I see other folks have questions. Thank you for those. Thanks, Sophia. All right, I think we have time to take a final round of three questions. Um, I'm going to jump in with a question that I'm going to turn it to Stephanie, and it looks like Chris also has a question. Um, I just wanted to kind of bring us to the current headlines today in terms of the way the military is being used to um, fortify the southern border and the kind of fall of Title 42 and, and the way in which the kind of buildup of the military is also being used to build up um, and terrorize migrant communities. Um, if you open CNN, that's kind of a head, headline there. So if any thoughts on the, those overlapping policies, and Stephanie, do you want to ask your question or I can read it out? What would you prefer? Al. It wasn't really a question. It was just a response to um, one of the questions that was there. I was just expanding on what Lyle had said because we don't, in most cases, we don't present an alternative because there are not any great alternatives um, but we present the actual experiences that people have gone through, which are not certainly are not publicized. The negative experiences are not publicized by the military or in the media or anything that students or most people in the country see or hear. And veterans also, the veterans who speak are speaking very openly and honestly. And that's something the students always, almost always in the comments we get, by uh, how honest and open the speakers were. And it's very hard for many veterans. Yeah, we're, I think you're breaking up. So I'm gonna uh, leave it there. We, we're having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay. No problem. But um, you bring up a good uh, point and ask, I encourage people to take a look at your thoughts in the um, chat. Chris, do you have a brief question you wanna throw in there? And then I'll also point people to Anna's question about trauma. Yes, thank you. I actually had two, but I'll just go with uh, the first. Uh, is there any experience of diaspora still in service, utilizing services and organizations like Courage to Resist and the GI Resistors Network or Hotline, uh, and additional considerations for green card soldiers when contacting and getting involved in veteran ad advocacy or service organizations? Thanks. Um, all right, so any any thoughts on this in terms of this continued conversation about alternatives, connections to militarizing the border, um, trauma, anything else folks want to jump in on? Wow. Yeah, just, just real quick. When it comes to the alternatives, again, I just want to emphasize there's like a very clear relationship between full employment, um, union density, uh, and the overall economic situation and how and whether the recruiters are having an easy time or not being able to bring people in the military. So for instance, right now, one of the reasons they're having a tough time bringing in, uh, you know, meeting their quotas is because we're at relative full employment. Um, and another thing I want to mention is just like the role of the draft. Um, you know, the draft effectively forced people to join the military, which in a way did allow for a lot of this activism and uh, radicalism within the military. Uh, you, you know, um, uh, Coco mentioned uh, fragging. There was also attempts to unionize uh, the rank and file. Uh, we no longer have the draft, so you no longer have as many people with that mindset. And then also the, the green card soldiers themselves and so many others, because they're volunteers, that is used against them uh, throughout their time in. I mean, you're just constantly, hey, at any given moment, if they're having a tough time, um, it's like, hey, you volunteered for this. You know, and that's used for everyone who's in the military, but particularly for green card soldiers, um, you know, that's constantly a card that's used as well. So um, I'll leave it at that because we're running out of time. Thanks, Lyle. I'll just throw in another question in case people want to reflect on how to think about connections to um, the refugee movement and also connections to peace building more generally. Is another question that Anne puts in the Q and A box. Monisha or Coco or Sophia, I was going to jump in about the border question because it's an important one. I think 
Um, for a long time now, this is not something that happened with Trump, everybody. The border has been militarized um, with equipment, strategies, um, resources flowing often pretty directly from whatever the US military is doing outside of the United States to the border with Mexico. So that during Vietnam War, like the helicopter pads that they had were used then, uh, you know, as part of the border wall, these like just flows of physical resources. And that continues today. The contractors, you know, must have their businesses, right? Um, that's what's driving some, some of this. And, and so like, if we're having less stuff in Afghanistan and Iraq, that stuff then needs to go to the border. Um, and there are like an increasing number of primarily state level deployment um, on, on the US-Mexico border and um, adding to like a soup of, of militarized agencies, alphabet soup of militarized agencies down there, you know, all kinds of local, state and, and federal forces all together at the border, extremely militarized, just like a zone of death. And it's a zone of death for those in those military units there as well. There's pretty high rate of suicide and people are deployed there for really long periods of time and are like, what are we doing? And um, in economically putting them in an extremely terrible economic situation as workers as well while they're there. Um, so that I wanted to say something about that. Thanks, Sophia. Monisha Coco, do you wanna wrap us up? Um, I don't wanna step on Coco. I do have something, but I want to check in first. Coco, did you have? Go for it. Thanks. Um, so I, I'm really uh, going to focus on Anne's question about what are other activities besides counter recruitment and other things that peace orders can do. Um, I think when when we look underneath why people are getting recruited we see colonialism. And when we look under colonialism, we see capitalism. And so something that I have longed for in the decade that I've been involved in the peace movement, both in the US and out of the US, is a focus on that. And, and, and sometimes I feel like we are more reactive and not as strategic and proactive as we could be. Um, and something that Coco had said earlier on is about how basically we are studied and that we need to study as much as we are studied by the people who are exploiting us. And I think it would be really powerful if the peace movement, the intergenerational peace movement, the intersectional peace movement, um, particularly the class conscious peace movement would focus more on talking about the sources that are at play and helping to build those alternatives to those things that exist in society that make all of these other things possible. So if we start deconstructing the machine, get in there with our tools and, and do that part, I think maybe we might not have to do so much of the reactive part. Um, I don't know, it's just an idea. Um, but I know for myself as a colonized person living in a colony, um, if folks supported our independence and, and, and got dirty for that with us, that would lead to a difference in how many Puerto Ricans are successfully recruited into the military because it would change our material conditions and it would change our capacity to say no because we don't need that. So I'll stop there because I know we're over time now. But thanks for letting me um, say that. Thanks, Monisha. Coco, I'll have you jump in and then I want to give the final word to our author. Thank you, Shannon. Um, and just building on what Monisha was saying, um, yeah, this is the, the question about uh, how the border is being militarized, I think conveys to us really clearly that um, the military or immigration customs enforcement or the police are not these kind of separate entities, but they are a conjoined vision of how to treat humanity and that we need to try to figure out campaigns that can be able to, you know, the, the people in power who are producing violence produce the coalitions that can then challenge them 
we're all getting screwed over, right? <laughs> um, and people who are um, fleeing uh, terrible conditions that in large part have been imposed by US policies are refugees, not enemy combatants, right? Um, and something that I'm really fearful of is that uh, racial supremacy, in particular white supremacy, is increasingly seeping into different Latinx and Caribbean communities, including in the US South. There was someone who uh, was, I think, of Latinx background who literally drove their van into a, a group of refugees. And, you know, so this is a really tragic situation. This is not at all just, um, you know, a, a, a talking point for people to try to, you know, muse over. Uh, the stakes are really high for us. And I think what we need to try to do is to figure out anti-war and immigrant justice groups forging explicitly anti-racist and anti-colonial campaigns, as Monique was sharing. And, you know, thinking that the far right has groups like Oath Keepers, that specifically target vets who have training. I think that people who are on the left who are looking towards justice need to have a strategy to deeply engage with both veterans and also communities that are being terrorized by racial supremacy. Um, very last thing that I'll say is um, right now, the war between Russia, the Ukraine, and now increasingly the US, a kind of, and NATO, a kind of proxy war that is occurring. I think that this is a really rare um, moment when a lot of people are seeing what the carnage of war actually is. It's being covered because this carnage is being inflicted upon light-skinned people and is therefore being, you know, broadly talked about, broadly documented. People are seeing what bombed out neighborhoods, hospitals, communities look like. And so I think similarly, as folks in previous generations tried to say, how do we visualize what war is? Right now, that is being visualized. It's being visualized in a very particular part of the world, but I think we need to try to broaden that out and say, this is what it looks like across these different places where people are being harmed, um, literally by imperial countries who are fighting with each other and using us as fodder. So I think we have a lot of work to do, but in some ways, I think this is um, a really pivotal moment historically when we can try and build broad peace movements that can also be broad liberatory movements. Thanks, Coco. And I'll turn it to Sophia to close us out. How can I follow Monisha and Coco? <laughs> um, I'm just going to say thank you to Monisha, Coco, and Lyle, and all the wonderful audience questions, because it really helped me think bigger um, the, about the, these, these issues, about the role of US military and, and US imperialism. And to return to the subtitle of my book, Between Model, Immigrant, and Security Threat, another way to think about youth, uh, immigrant youth being recruited and enlisting in the US military is that each one of them is a threat, a threat to empire, and um, a way to see a future where there is no US military. I'll end there. Thanks everybody. Um, we have recorded this and we will share with everyone who has registered. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening.